So today we're gonna to be working on the Corvettes. Uh, unfortunately, the AC has gone out. Uh, it's June in Texas and that's kind of a necessity. So today we're gonna to be going over what I think is wrong with the AC system, which to spoil the surprise, it's the clutch on the AC compressor, which means the entire AC compressor needs to be replaced. Now, typically GM would tell you, you have to drop the entire front end of the Corvette, like all the suspension to get to the AC compressor and swap it out. But there's a guy out there with a YouTube channel, I think it's CT Racer X, something like that. Uh, he figured out a way to swap out your compressor without dropping the front end. We're gonna try his approach. Uh, we're gonna do a little bit more. Uh, the diagnosis, why I think the clutch is bad. Uh, we need to also remove the refrigerant from the system before we can fix everything. We're gonna do that. And then once we're all done, we're gonna charge the system back up and hopefully it works. Hopefully I diagnose this correctly. So let's get to it. So this is what's happening. If we start the Corvette, we've got our AC on all the way, but it does not cool. And if you look in here, so this is gonna be pretty hard to see, but if you look underneath this big pulley right here, right under there is the AC compressor. And if you look at it, you can see the middle portion of it is not moving. And that means the clutch is not engaging and the compressor is not working at all. So we need to figure out why the clutch isn't engaging. Now, unfortunately, there are many reasons as to why your AC clutch could not be engaging. The first one is the button. So the AC button in here, it could just be bad. It could be that there's not a signal uh, telling the clutch to turn on. Uh, I don't think that's the case in my case though, because if we remove the fuse cover right here, there is a fuse that goes from the switch to the relay for the AC compressor. And so this specifically is a 2015 C7 Corvette and fuses can vary from year to year, uh, but ours specifically is number 35 AC clutch. So 35 is this guy right here next to this big gray relay, it's a small 10 amp fuse there. Uh, I have already pulled this, checked it, the fuse is good. So if your fuse was blown, that means you probably got a short somewhere in your system, you could replace the fuse, it might work for a little while, but you're gonna have to chase down your short. So the next thing that could still be wrong though is this fuse leads to a relay that turns the AC clutch on. And the clutch for us is uh, down here under micro relays, number 59 AC control. So this guy right here, that's number 59, that is our relay that turns on the AC clutch. Uh, the thing is, these relays can go bad, so you wanna test your relay too. Or, an easier way to do it, if you look, you'll notice that the part number on this relay and the part number on this relay right here are the same. So what you can do, if you don't know how or don't wanna test your relay, you can just swap relays, and assuming the other relay works, uh, if you swap them and your AC starts working, that means your relay is bad. You just need to get a new relay and swap that out. Unfortunately, our relay also uh, is not the problem. Now there are also pressure sensors to consider and that is not specific to the Corvette. Pretty much every car that has an AC system has a high and a low side pressure sensor. And if the pressure is too low or too high, it will not let the compressor turn on and cool the car. So that's a lot harder to check, uh, but the way I did it, I got a OBT, OBD2 adapter, plugged it in, got an app off the internet. I can't remember which one. I'll try and find it, put it down in the comments. Uh, but Best I can tell, the car is receiving and reading signals for the high and low side, uh, and they look right. What I also did is I uh, took a set of AC gauges and hooked them up to uh, the line. So this is uh, the high side on the C7. The low side is hidden underneath this uh, reservoir here, which we're gonna have to remove in a minute. And when I say remove, we're just gonna kind of slide it out of the way. Uh, but right now I'm getting about 65, I think, PSI on both the high and the low side, which is wrong. Like your low side should be low, your high side should be high. And the reason they're the same is because the compressor is not engaging. When your compressor turns on and starts doing what it's supposed to do, your low side goes low, the high side goes high, and everything's happy. But we're not getting that. The system isn't even kicking on. So it seems like we should be getting power to the compressor to turn the clutch on. The thing is on the C7 Corvette specifically, there is one other thing that could be wrong with the power getting to the clutch. And that is, uh, I can't show it to you right now, I'll show it to you later. But the plug on the compressor, apparently on the assembly line, some plugs were not seated all the way and they can kind of walk themselves back out. So I did already get under there, push the plug in as much, actually I took it off and put it back on and it still does not work. So it's not power getting to the compressor, at least I don't think. So I have a whole new, AC compressor unit, and we're gonna try and replace that right after we evacuate the refrigerant out of the system. And to do that, we have this wonderfully generic refrigerant recovery unit. We also have a refrigerant recovery tank. 
And to be honest, these weren't the, the cheapest tools. What you could do is you could take your car to a shop and pay them like 75 bucks, have them drain the refrigerant out of it for you. Uh, the thing is, every time I take one of my cars to a shop, something comes back broken. So uh, number one, by buying this, I can do it myself, not deal with that. Uh, number two, I know I'm gonna have to do this again, the, uh, the RX-7 that we're hopefully working on soon if the shop ever gets done. Um, it has a fully charged, fully working, fully cold AC system. Wish I could just swap it out. Um, but I, we're gonna need to drain that uh, 55. I wanna do some AC work on, so I'm gonna use this again in the future. The uh, first thing we need to do though, these tanks, they typically come with nitrogen in them, so we need to get that out of there. Which, there we go. And now that our nitrogen is all gone, uh, it's been replaced by air, so we need to get that air out of there too. And for that, we're gonna use a vacuum pump, which is another tool I had to buy. You can see, I haven't even used a pump yet, but this is a. Uh, Extreme US power. I'll link to everything in the description, but this is the the gauge set I used to figure out what pressure was in the Corvette's AC system. And it also came with a pump, which we are about to open and use. So we're going to hook the vacuum pump up to the recovery tank, get all of the air out of there, and then close it up, and then it will be ready to put the Freon or R134A from the car into the tank. All right, take two. Uh, so I was working on this other day and I forgot something pretty important that stopped us from doing the job. So I mentioned we had this, uh, this manifold set, right? And we're gonna use this to drain the refrigerant from the car. So you got the high side line that goes to the high port. You got the low side line that goes to the low port. We'll hook those up in a second. Uh, then you got this yellow line. So this is, uh, this is where they mix kind of in here. And the yellow line is going to go onto uh, this dryer that actually came with the uh, the recovery machine. So we're gonna plug that on there in just a second. You got the dryer line going in uh, and then coming out, we had, well, we had nothing and that's where I messed up. So uh, the tank and the recovery machine did not come with an extra line. The manifold set did not come with an extra line. So I had to go out and pick up some extra lines. So now we can run uh, the output from the recovery machine down to the low side on the tank. And then we should be able to recover our refrigerant. So I will admit, this is the first time I'm doing this myself, so I'm not sure this is really how to, but this may be a, um, a cautionary tale. Uh, so one of the things I've actually, I found a good video online on YouTube. Uh, I think the guy's name is, or the channel's name, it's F33. I'll put a link to it down in the description. He's got a really good tutorial on how to, uh, you know, get a home use recovery machine, hook it up, all that sort of stuff. So I'm kind of following his instructions. The only thing is my machine here is different than his. He's got like a valve for this side and a valve for that side. I just have one kind of thing in the middle here. Uh, so I'm going to do a little bit of winging it and all the AC pros can tell me down in the comments how I messed it up. But uh, what we're going to do is we're going to hook the high side and the low side up. All of our valves are closed right now. And again, the order of valves is really important. So like uh, with the recovery tank, the reason we had to close the valve before we turned off the vacuum pump is because if there's vacuum in there, and you turn off the vacuum pump, it's gonna try and suck everything back through. So whenever you're doing this, maybe check out that, that other video first, uh, just in case I mess this one up. Uh, but pay important attention as to like when you open and close things, what's on, what's off, that sort of stuff, because you don't wanna like go and fill up your system, turn off the pump, and then all your refrigerant drains right back out because you didn't close the valve. So all of our valves are closed and off right now. I'm gonna go ahead and hook up the machine, which is easy, you just, uh, Hook it up to this little inline dryer right here. The high side on the Corvette is easy to get to. You just take this black cap off right here. You're gonna take our high side line again, make sure it is closed and it just, it just kind of clips on. And the high and low side, they're different sizes so you can't mess them up. So the low side, this is where things start to get interesting. So we've got one bolt right there and uh, one nut right there that we gotta undo. And then we can kind of shimmy this uh, reservoir here out of the way. And the low side is right down in that hole. You can see down there that black cap, that is our low side port and moving this gives us just enough room to put our slim lady finger hand in there and uh, get it off and put the, the manifold port on there. All right, so we are now connected and uh, then we open up our valves here and here. That should get us pressure in here. 
So if you notice, this is reading way higher than I said it was reading before. So today it's reading about 120 on each side. And so whenever I tested it before, that was back in February. The AC went back at, went out back in February. I was trying to figure out what was wrong back then. And temperature and humidity and stuff all plays into the pressure in your system. And so if you check out the thermometer here, it's a little warm today. So I guess between February and now the pressure has doubled, which is crazy. Uh, but we're gonna we're gonna go with it. Get it out of there. Uh, it's it's not exploding now, so it, it shouldn't explode later. To evacuate the refrigerant, we're gonna take that extra line I mentioned. We're gonna put it onto the out ports of our recovery machine. And on the low pressure side of the recovery tank. Why? Because that's what the other guy on YouTube did. So that's what I'm gonna do too. So again, all of our valves are closed right now. So as we open these up, that's gonna dictate what happens. So one thing to remember right now is all of our lines are empty, but they're also filled with atmosphere. So atmosphere is not Freon, it's not refrigerant. Our 134A is what we're dealing with. So we wanna get all the atmosphere out of the lines before we start putting anything into our tank. So the way we're gonna do that, and that's why, I don't know why this machine only has one valve. Uh, in the other video, the guy, he, uh, he had two valves. He could open this one, open that one. It put uh, pressure into the lines. And then what he didn't do actually, is you can come down here, just vent this a little bit. That should get the air out of your lines. Uh, then all of your lines are filled with refrigerants. And then you can open this valve or turn on the machine, open this valve and then pump everything into the tank. So we're just gonna kind of do what I think I should do, which is uh, I'm gonna open all the valves except for the tank and that should pressurize the system. So we know there's 120 PSI coming from the car uh, into the machine as soon as we open the machine. Uh, once we have the valve in this open and down to the lines, we'll vent this just a little bit and then we'll open our tank and that should allow probably a good portion of it to flow into the tank because remember the tank's under vacuum this is under pressure so it will just naturally flow through unless something in the machine is stopping it and then uh once we get our initial flow go ahead and turn the machine on and get it all out of there and so on the machine this is the pressure coming in this is the pressure going out so what we want to do is get this down to zero so we know everything's out of the car okay so these valves are already open we're going to go ahead and open these and that should allow the pressure to start to mix in here. So we are getting nothing on the machine so I'm going to turn the dial see what happens. Oop! We have pressure. Uh, so this is just I guess that opens the valve. We're not uh, using the machine to transfer it yet. So now we should have pressure from the car to the machine. Yep we got pressure going out too. So that means this line should now be pressurized with uh, you know, the residual atmosphere in there. So we're just gonna vent it a little bit. And that should be enough. So next step, we're gonna open this valve and that should get it flowing into the tank. There you go. Pressure from the car is going down. You can hear it going into the tank. So we are working, we'll give that a second to do its thing, equalize the pressure, and then we will turn this on to start the process of pumping it out. All right, you can see the uh, pressure's dropped now. Can't really hear anything moving anymore, so we're gonna switch her on. All right, so I think we are done. We've got, uh, we're actually reading a vacuum on the input pressure. We've got over 100 PSI in uh, the pressure going to the tank. And then uh, coming from the car, we've got a vacuum here and we've got a vacuum there. So all around the refrigerant is out now or should be out. I closed the valves before I turned off the machine just to make sure nothing went back or forth. Uh, so now we can turn this all off. It's just vacuum in there. So you're not dealing with anything now. And really, as far as the car is concerned, it doesn't matter because we're gonna open the system. It doesn't matter if it's a vacuum. Well, I guess the thing you don't want in there is refrigerant still. We're trying to get rid of that. And the whole thing about this draining your refrigerant, like a lot of times when you go to work on cars, if they have an AC leak, like your refrigerant's already gone. It's already in the atmosphere. So R134A, it's not an ozone killing chemical. So if you let it out accidentally, uh, it's not going to deplete the ozone, but it is a greenhouse gas. So if global warming is a thing, then it could contribute to that. So that's the whole purpose of behind getting it into the tank. And then also Freon or R134A, I'm just going to call it Freon from now on. It doesn't go bad, it doesn't degrade. So we could use the same refrigerant we took out of the tank or out of the car, put it in the tank, and then put it right from the tank back into the car. 
I just don't know if I'm that good or not, so I'm probably gonna use new stuff, uh, but you could if you wanted to. So now comes the fun part, actually replacing the compressor. And to do that, we gotta get the car up off the ground. Uh, the other guy, I think CT Racer X, whatever. We're just gonna call him the other guy. He used the jack stands underneath his Corvette. Uh, I'm gonna be using ramps and not the two post lift because nobody's put that up yet. But yeah, we're gonna get this thing uh, up in the air on ramps. And again, the other guy's video is really good. The thing is he just, he shows you everything after he's already got it out of the car. So I'm gonna take you all along with me and show it to you as I try to get it out. And you can hear how many curse words come out of my mouth. He also glossed over some stuff. So like this, uh, I think the one he was working on had a supercharge on it, but like this, this air vent here has got to come out and we'll go over everything, well, right now. So the AC compressor way down there, it runs off the accessory belt. So we're gonna have to get the accessory belts off and to get access to the tensioner, which is right down in there too. Uh, this guy pretty much has to be out of the way. There, there might be a way to get it off without uh, moving this, but I have not been able to do it. So to get that off, it's to get this off. So we've got one, two, three, and then on the other side is a fourth seven millimeter uh, hex screw. Uh, we're gonna take this off real quick. And get this intake hose out of the way. These little uh, hose clips right here, you just squeeze them and they pop right off. Eight millimeter nut on the hose clamps. And you just kind of wiggle until she comes off. So the belt tensioner is that pulley right there. And if we take a, what is this, 15 millimeter socket and we put it on the nut on the middle of that pulley, and then you pretend like you're tightening it, which is super counterintuitive, that will release the tension on the belt and then you can take it off. I like to take mine off the alternator up there uh, and then you just slowly release it back. And uh, I think you actually have to take the tensioner off. So let's do that. So the, uh, the top 15 millimeter bolt, that came out easy enough. You can see we can't really get it out though because the, uh, the steering rack is in the way here. The bottom bolt, uh, you can kind of see where it's pivoting right there. It's like all the way at the very bottom. We're not gonna be able to get a wrench on that until we move the steering rack. So we're gonna have to do that anyway. So we're gonna go ahead and uh, move the steering rack now. Down here, we've got a uh, one 18 millimeter bolt right there. That's gotta come out. Other side, got another one right up in there. That's gotta come out. And then these, uh, those two bolts right there, uh, 13 millimeter bolts, they gotta come off too. And all those should allow us to get that whole steering rack to just kind of wiggle around in there. All right, so far not too bad. We're only about 30 minutes in, even including jacking up the car. Uh, I do have to apologize for the lighting though, because there is there is none. I uh, had to close the door, turn the AC on, because it's just getting way too hot. Even with that, 108 degrees. Uh, but the next step up, we uh, need to start removing the compressor itself. So if you look down there, there is a there's a 13 millimeter bolt kind of up top there. There's this little uh, nut with a stud coming through it. And so we're going to remove both the nuts and the stud. Uh, for the stud, you're going to need, um, up till now, we've just been using regular sockets. The stud, you're going to need uh, this type of socket. It's a E7 reverse hex socket. We're going to take that out. And then at that point, we should be able to rotate the compressor that way. Uh, get to one last bolt holding the AC lines on. There's also two electrical connectors, one on the top, one towards the back. And uh, once we get all those undone, I'll show them to you once we get it, the unit out of the car. And that's really actually the part I'm most concerned about. Uh, so our, our friend, the other guy said, you can just move the power steering rack forward and get the AC compressor out of there. I'm not seeing how we're gonna do that. There's a sway bar down there. There's a radiator hose. There's really nowhere to move it. So unless he was going up, I don't know. I'm just gonna unbolt things, start wiggling stuff around and see what we can do. So this is a standard socket, and as you can see, you can, if you rotate the compressor enough, you can get the socket on there, but there is no way you're getting a wrench on there. I, however, had a secret weapon, so let me show you that real quick. So this is a standard socket, right? You put a wrench on there, that's what, like almost two inches worth of wrench? Not getting that in there. So my secret weapon was the Christmas present someone gave me like 10 years ago, and I was like, I'm never gonna use this, and it's, it's coming in handy. So this is a, um, it is a uh, Craftsman uh, ratchet set, and uh, you can see the, um, the socket here, it goes inside of the wrench. And so for total thickness, it's way shallower than a traditional socket. So uh, again, Craftsman, you can probably pick these up at Lowe's these days. Don't know exactly what it's called. I'll try to link to it down in the description. Oh, are we, are we talking about this? This is, um, this is the other Christmas present somebody gave me recently. It's coming in handy. I don't care what it looks like.
<sighs> so the compressor is out uh, after declaring victory on that yesterday. I called it a day because it was really hot. Uh, so I did have to do one additional thing to get it out. And I have no idea how the other guy got his out by moving the steering rack forward or by just moving the steering rack forward. Cause um, let me show you. So there's a bracket right here that prevents the steering rack from going forward. It can only move forward like an inch with that bracket right there. And if you look at it, it holds on the sway bar, but it also it connects to the subframe and it connects up to the frame. So I didn't want to start taking that stuff apart only to have it become a problem, have the subframe drop down, something like that. Uh, so what I did wind up having to do, actually, you can see right there, I had to put the car on jack stands. Uh, so I jacked it up uh, in the middle. And then what that allowed us to do is turn the wheel ever so slightly. And it's, well, it's, I think it's resting on the ramps again. Uh, but I just, I turned the wheel maybe, I don't know, like two or three inches that way. And normally all that would do is it would just compress the steering boot. But in our case, what it let me do is slide the steering rack over just like another inch or two. And it got uh, that big, that big part right there. It got that all out of the way for us. And we were able to slide the AC compressor up out this hole right there. And so the, uh, the air box used to be right here. I had to take that off. There's just a 10 millimeter bolt on each side, a little bit of wiggling. It comes right out. And uh, so moving the steering rack that way, I also rotated it a little bit forward, like kind of like that direction. And that allowed us to get it out of there. So if you're looking at this guy, this is how it sits in the car. You got your, uh, your 13 millimeter bolt that goes up here and it kind of threads into itself. The stud goes down there. There's your nut for the stud. And then your last bolt is over here on the side. That's where the AC lines connect. And that's where we had to use that special socket to uh, get in there and get that off. The electrical connections, uh, one is up at the top here, and this is actually the connector for the clutch. The other one is down here right below where your AC lines connect. And connectors are always kind of a problem, but the way I got these ones off uh, is on the top here. Put a long screwdriver down through uh, where underneath the alternator right there. That allowed me to get to the top one. And so all I did was like right where the clip is, just press down on the clip and then push like that. And it slides the connector off of this other connector. And then on the bottom one, uh, I got a really small screwdriver, got in there with that screwdriver. Same thing, push, slide, came right off. So we've got our new compressor here. The uh, kit that I ordered also comes with uh, some new O-rings. So these go on where the uh, AC lines mount up to the compressor. It's also got this plug on here to keep all the oil in. So in your compressor, uh, or actually in your AC lines, it's not just refrigerant, there is oil in there too. And that acts as a lubricant for the compressor. So uh, GM or AC Delco compressors, they take PAG 46, the number is important. Uh, it depends on the type of compressor you have. I got some just in case I needed it. I didn't know if I would, but this compressor is actually pre-filled. It has 1.4 ounces of oil in it and so the instructions say if two ounces or less comes out of your old compressor you're good to go you don't need to add any more if more than two ounces comes out then you need to add oil uh, up to whatever amount you're missing one other thing i got uh, is uh, the dryer so in your ac system there's a dryer it's a desiccant type of thing and you're supposed to replace these every two years or every time you open your ac system so i don't know how often y'all are replacing your desiccant, but I'm not opening it every two years. So this is the first time this one will be ever, ever be changed. So we're gonna go ahead and do that. But first I'm going to get this guy back in here. It probably took me a good hour of just wiggling to get the old compressor out there. I'm hoping get the new one back in will be a lot easier, especially now that I know the trick to uh, turn the wheels and move the steering rack out of the way. So yeah, we'll get the compressor in there. We'll get everything bolted down. Then we'll change out the dryer and then uh, charge the system and we should have AC. And that right there, it's about all you need to get the compressor in and out. And so if anyone's wondering if moving your uh, tires like this will mess up your alignment, the answer is no. So it's not like we're taking off the toe adjustment or caster or camber or anything like that. It's the, the steering rack is just loose and the whole thing is moving. And then once we bolt it back into place, everything is gonna be just like it was before. So the compressor is approximately where it needs to go. It's not bolted up yet, but that, uh, that only took like, I don't know, 10 minutes compared to the hour it took before. And so the, uh, it took me a little while to figure it out, but the way you want to slide it in, uh, so that's upright in the car. You want to turn it a little bit like that and then slide her in, turn it back, good to go. 
All right, compressor's back in and bolting it up was actually easy, like really a lot easier than I thought it was gonna be. And one of the reasons for that is uh, this little bushing right here. So this is that long 13 millimeter bolt and it threads into this bushing. Uh, but in the new unit that you get, the bushing is um, out the opposite direction. So you have a lot of room here to uh, get the compressor up where it needs to be, thread the bolt through, put that stud in there, and then you just tighten everything down. It pulls this bushing back in and you don't have to like pry this around like we were earlier. And on prying, I didn't really have to pry it around to get it out at all. I think CT racer, he said you need a pry bar. You can just use your hands. It's probably a little bit harder, but it is, it is possible. So now just need to hook up the electrical. I'll put the tensioner and all that stuff back in and then we'll get to that dryer. And on the connection for the AC lines, I was able to get a, a torque wrench in there. So if you're doing this, you'll need a, uh, a foot, no, an inch pound or a Newton meter torque wrench. Uh, the specs come with the O-rings, which it was between 15 and 20 inch, no, between 15 and 20 Newton meters. I did 17 and a half, so right in the middle. All right, do you want the good news or the bad news? The good news is that everything is going back together nicely. The bad news is that I just found out where the desiccant or the dryer goes. So it goes in the AC condenser, which is in front of the radiator. And it's on this side. There's like a big long cylinder on the side of it and the desiccant comes out the bottom. It like unscrews out the bottom. The problem is underneath the condenser where we have to get to is the radiator mount and that is welded to the car. And so the only way to get the condenser out is to take the radiator out. And that's not hard. It's just something I wasn't planning on doing and it's messy. It, you just get radiator fluid everywhere. So again, not hard, just not looking forward to doing it. I did actually, I already tried. There's, uh, there's two 15 millimeter bolts that hold the radiator to uh, the car, basically. I already tried shimmying it back, seeing if I could get enough room just to get to the bottom of the condenser and unscrew it. And the answer is no, there is just too much going on in here. We need to get uh, at minimum those hoses out, maybe the fan off. So I'm going to start draining. There is a uh, if you look underneath the car, there's a little drain, or you can see right there, there's a little drain right there to get the fluid out. I'm just probably gonna undo the hose, let everything drain out, take off both of the hoses, uh, and maybe that will give us enough room to shimmy everything forward. If it doesn't, then I'll take off the fan, and if I may just take the whole thing out. It's really not that hard. Uh, Mishimoto has a good video out there, which I'll also link to about how to remove a radiator if you're in, putting in a performance radiator. So if you wanna put in a performance radiator, now's a good time if you're gonna have to take yours out anyway. So remove the radiator. Put this thing in, put it all back together, unless there's something else. Can you tell I'm defeated? I'm not defeated, I'm just, it's messy. Morgan Deuce, we have access. Uh, so it actually was not too bad at all, especially given that like, most of this, like all the intake stuff was already gone and you do not have to take the radiator out. All you gotta do is uh, I got the fan out of there and then moved it forward. So to get that out, there was, uh, I think I called these 15 earlier. These are the two 13 millimeter bolts that hold down the whole radiator uh, support. These two 10 millimeter bolts, they hold in the fan. There's one on either side for those. Then there were a number of uh, clips here holding the radiator hose to the fan. There's a fan electrical connection over here. Somewhere it's now lost in the depths of the car for all time. Here it is right there. Just came off with my thumb. Uh, this breather hose didn't bother taking that off. And that hose down there, the one that goes right there, is a quick disconnect. It's got a, uh, a spring clip that holds it in. But the good news is you don't have to worry about that. That was kind of a pain in the butt to get off. Uh, but I don't think that actually needed to come off. So now if you, uh, if you go under the car, God, it's still dripping. Uh, but now you can see um, right there that black, uh, cap there with a hex key uh, or Allen wrench insert. Uh, you have access to that, so I'm gonna go get, oh God, it's still leaking. Oh, now it's falling. I'm gonna go to hex key real quick and try and get this thing switched out before all the radiator fluid drains on the floor. Check this out, all these hex keys and none of them fit. So the, uh, the hex key size on the bottom of this thing here, it is uh, 12 millimeters. It's a big boy. I actually had to go out and buy one. It comes, uh, or the only one I could find came in a half inch drive. So we got the, the big socket wrench here too. Uh, but once we had that, it came out no problem. It's, uh, it's really easy to get out. Uh, so this is the old one here and you can see it looks, you know, pretty used. So I think it's a good thing that we're replacing it. We got the, uh, the new guy here. So I'll go ahead and 
throw this in momentarily. It shouldn't be bad at all. Um, and really getting the radiator out, getting access to where this comes out of and goes into, not a big deal at all. I think I spent more time thinking about how much I didn't want to do it than I actually did doing it. So uh, pretty easy, especially compared to what you've probably already done. This is like the easiest part. Uh, but so yeah, I'm just gonna throw this back in, start bolting stuff back up, and then we can charge the system and it should cool. So I bought the 50-50 mix of Dexcool and water uh, to put into the Corvette here. And I know some of you will say, why buy 50-50? Just buy the straight stuff and you have water. Thing is, we have a water softener here. And so if I put that water in the engine, that's like putting salt in the engine, which would be bad. Uh, and I could buy water, but when you have screaming children in the back of the car, you, you just don't do that. So we got 50-50. The problem is the Corvette takes 40-60. I don't know why it's different, but it is. So 40% Dex cool, 60% water, or if you have a 50-50 gallon of coolant, that means you need to put in approximately one bottle of Gatorade. I mean, sorry, four cups of water. Let's, yeah, let's use water. So the coolant reservoir is actually that thing that we unbolted to get to all the AC ports. So we're gonna pour it in here. Uh, I think it'll drain in. And then uh, we're gonna need to start the engine, let it cycle, top it off and continue until it's all happy and full. So the radiator's filled, everything should be hooked uh, back up properly. The AC system is not yet charged, but we wanna go ahead and make sure we got the coolant where we want it, and then uh, we'll fill the AC system. But first, gotta turn this guy on, let him heat up, let the thermostat cycle, top off the coolant, and then AC. Oh, and even though the AC system isn't charged yet, that shouldn't be a problem. Remember those high and low pressure sensors? It will sense approximately zero pressure in there right now because there's no pressure in there, and the AC system or the compressor shouldn't engage. If it doesn't engage, we have a problem. So the clutch on the compressor down there, still not turning. That's exactly what we want. So the operating temperature of the C7 is about 190 degrees. We just hit that. We also just beeped. Uh, so turn the car off. That means the water pump should, the thermostat should be open. The water pump should be circulating everything. Uh, so now we're going to give that a chance to cool off. You don't want to open this guy right now to check on him because he's gonna be hot and under pressure. Uh, but what we are gonna do now is go ahead and pull a vacuum on our AC system. So what you need to do to uh, test and prepare your system is uh, take, we're gonna take the, the low pressure side, we're gonna put it on the low pressure port, which we're gonna watch out because this tank is now probably approximately 190 degrees. Uh, so we're gonna reach back there, get the low pressure port on without burning ourselves. Uh, the high pressure port, we'll put that on too, and we'll hook all of that up to the vacuum pump. So not the reclamation machine, but the vacuum pump. And we are going to pull a vacuum on our system all the way down as, as low as you can go. So all the way down to that like negative 30 inches of mercury. And then what we're going to do is we're going to wait. We're going to wait about a half hour, 45 minutes, and then come back and hopefully it will still be at that same level, uh, negative 30. 30 inches of mercury. If it's not, that means we have a leak. That means our compressor seal that we just installed is bad or the desiccant seal that we just installed is bad. And now that I'm thinking about it, if you're doing this, not me, because it's too late for me, I'd probably pull a vacuum before I put the rest of the engine together, before I fill the radiator, all that stuff, because then if we do have a problem with one of the seals, all of this would still be out. But as it is, if we have a problem, I have to take all this apart again. So. We're gonna pull a vacuum real quick. Hopefully, I don't have to take anything apart again. Low pressure on and open. I use protection. High pressure on, open. All the valves open so we get as much vacuum out or as much air out as fast as possible. Vacuum pump, turn it on. So we are now vacuumed all the way down and we're going to close these valves. So we close them off from the vacuum pump. Turn the pump off. And we're gonna leave these guys open so we can monitor the pressure. And we're gonna walk away for about a half hour and hopefully whenever we come back, they're in the same exact spot. And we are exactly where we left it. So uh, we are good to charge the system, 
But before we do that, we need to do a little more pumping. So while we do have a vacuum on the system, there could still be some moisture in there. So to make sure all the moisture is gone, what we're gonna do is uh, open the valves back up, turn our pump back on, and let that run for probably about an hour just to make sure everything's out of the system, then we'll come back and charge it. All right, an hour later, we're going to close both valves, turn off our pump, and disconnect this line. So to charge the system, we've got a couple things here. Uh, what you're gonna need, you're gonna need your manifold gauge set that we've been using. Uh, so right now, both of these valves are shut off, so that means nothing's coming in through the yellow line. Both of these valves are open now, and we're going to leave those open so we can monitor the pressure on the gauges. Uh, the high side though, on the manifold here, this is going to remain closed though. So you're, whenever you're filling refrigerant, it goes in the low side. So once we get that hooked up, we'll open the, the low valve. Uh, but we want to be able to see pressure on the low and the pressure on the high. That's why the high pressure side is going to remain on. Now there are charts for how much PSI is supposed to be in your system based on the temperature, humidity, that sort of stuff. But we're going to do what I call the easy method of filling and not have to worry about that. So if you look on your car somewhere, it should tell you the refrigerant that you have and then how much goes in your system. So in this case, it's 0.6 kilograms, which is useless. What's a kilogram? Uh, but if you convert it, it comes out to 21.6 ounces. So what we've got here is two 12 ounce cans of R134. And so it's gonna take at least one can, that's 12 ounces right there. And we're gonna need about another 10 ounces. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna hook everything up and we're going to weigh our Freon can. And whenever we uh, take out 10 ounces, uh, our scale will tell us, you know, 10 ounces is gone. Uh, then we should be good to go. We'll double check our pressures. Uh, I did find uh, just like kind of a, a typical pressure chart. It's not specific to the Corvette, but it should give us a ballpark. And if our pressures are about where they need to be and uh, we've weighed our Freon and we put the right amount in, we should be good to go and it should cool. So to get all this going, uh, these cans, they take a uh, tap. This came with the uh, vacuum and manifold set kit. We will put this onto our yellow line right here for the, uh, the manifold gauge set that I got the, what is it, Extreme US Power. There is an adapter that you need. So put that adapter on. So we got our can of refrigerant here and the way this works is you screw it on to your tap. And then whenever we screw down this uh, silver guy right here all the way, that will pierce the can and open everything up. So we're gonna go ahead and do that. Everything is closed right now. Okay, so we are now pierced, uh, but that also means that we're closed. So we're gonna open this back up and that will allow the refrigerant to get into the line. Uh, but our line, once again, has atmosphere in it probably. So what we're gonna do is purge the yellow line again. I actually found out as I was doing this, uh, this, uh, this little cap right here where the yellow line goes in, it's got a straighter valve on it. And then you just kind of press on that and it will purge. Pretty cool. Oop. Okay. So we're now ready for the refrigerant to go into the car. Uh, what we need to do now is start the car. So what's going to happen is the pressure in the can is going to trick the low pressure sensor switch in the car into thinking that it has a full charge. And then the compressor will hopefully kick on, assuming we installed everything correctly, uh, and then pull the refrigerant into the low side. So we're gonna open the low valve. Uh, that makes all that happen with the car on, and then things should start to go. So we're gonna go through this entire can, then we'll uh, put on this can, weigh it, take out uh, 10 ounces. And so actually this, um, just bought the, uh, the Amazon Basics scale. And so it, it reads ounces and also Whenever you put weight on it, you can just press this button again and it zeroes the whole thing out. So what I'm going to do is since the can and the line and everything weighs more than however much we need to take out, I'm just going to put the whole thing on there, zero it out, and then we'll go to negative 10 ounces and that'll be 22 ounces of refrigerant into the system. Should be what we need. We'll check our pressure. Things should be cooling. We should be good to go. So low side open. Went up right up to 100 PSI. So there's, there's some pressure in that little can. High side stays closed. We're just gonna monitor pressure on that side. Gonna start the car. Oh, and whenever you start your car, you wanna set your AC to full blast as cold as it can be so everything gets all sucked in. So if you can see down there, barely, the clutch is engaged, compressor's working. So we're gonna take our can and just kinda shake it around, make sure we get everything out of there. And then uh, whenever we're satisfied, everything's out, switch over to the other can and we'll measure that one. Right now our low side is, looks like it's about 25, high side is about 175 
And according to our chart, we need to be approximately somewhere around 55 and uh, 375 at this temperature. So we got a ways to go. We need more, uh, more refrigerant. So the way I'm gonna switch, switch out cans is I just uh, undid this all the way. The can self seals, so it should be sealed off now. Close the low valve, we'll put the new can on and then open the low valve up slowly uh, and measure as we go. And I just noticed my uh, low line was on the exhaust manifold. So pay attention to where your lines are. That could have been a problem. All right, we're uh, reading 15.9. We're gonna zero that out. So now we'll go to negative 10. It's cold, we did it. Car off, the gauges aren't reading right anymore. The system will start to equalize, but uh, we got to approximately where uh, the PSI that that chart showed. So uh, the low side was about 50, the high side was about 280, and I think there's a typo in the chart. I think it's supposed to say 275 to 300, not 375 to 300. Uh, so pay attention to that. But to finish everything off, we're just gonna make sure all of our valves are closed, pop them off, and then um, we're done. So I'm not gonna lie, that was, a bit more work than I thought it was going to be just because we're running into issues, you know, every step along the way, as usual. Should have foreseen that. Um, but it is, I'd say, if so, I did this over a period of days, just kind of when I had spare time. But if you were to like start on a, I don't know, Saturday morning, like eight in the morning, go all day, I think you could probably get it done in a day. I'd say if you can, um, let's see, if you can change a clutch, you can do this easy. If an idiot such as myself who knows nothing about air conditioning can. Get this all done, get it all back together, have cold AC blowing. And I mean, it's it rained for five minutes, it hasn't blown up yet, so we should be good, right? Also saved a bunch of money. So to get this done at a shop is about three grand. And so I did spend like the the recovery machine there is about 350 bucks. The vacuum pump and manifold set was a hundred bucks. Scale, I think was like 12 bucks. Refrigerant, gotta pay for that anyway. Oh, and the tank was about 60 bucks and the parts themselves. So I think the compressor was somewhere around 300, 350, something like that. And the desiccant wasn't very much. I want to say it was like 30 bucks. It's all around, but let's say a thousand dollars in tools and parts to get this done. Still saved like two grand right there. And my time is worthless. So that doesn't matter. I mean, priceless. My time is, no, it's worthless. But also now I know how to work on an AC system and I will be using these tools again because I have other systems to service. But for now, uh, don't forget to like and subscribe. But until next time, I think I'm just gonna close the hood, roll the windows up, put the top on, and just go take a drive in the cold, cold AC. See you later.